Welcome everyone to the second module in the CCNA training. Today we're going to look at uh, some collisions and switching and VLANs and VTP and finally we'll end with some iOS commands that you'll find useful on switches. So let's get started. From last time you'll recall that uh, Ethernet basically combines all devices into a single wire. That is all devices share the same media. And so this presents a problem when two devices try to talk at once. That is, what happens when two devices try to raise that voltage of that wire at the same time? We refer to this as a collision. And the idea behind a collision is that uh, basically you have some sort of interference. The frame won't be transmitted successfully if two people or two devices are trying to talk at once. To basically avoid collisions, to try to sense them and detect them and account for them, we have an algorithm that we call Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection. For short, we call it CSMA slash CD. Now the actual algorithm itself is fairly straightforward, as you might expect. The basic idea behind this algorithm is to do carrier sense, that is, we want to look at the wire we have, because we have multiple access, that is, we have many devices that could potentially be talking at once. And then we want to do collision detection. When a collision occurs, we want to detect it and we want to handle it accordingly. So the first thing we do is we basically do the carrier sense part of that, out, that uh, acronym. We want to wait until another host is not transmitting. That is, we wait until the line is free, until nobody else is talking. Once we detect that nobody else is talking, we can start talking ourselves. And so the device will actually begin transmitting data once it sees that the wire is free. Now, it just might happen that another device has also been waiting for the line to be free and might begin talking at the same time. If this happens, basically, the devices will both see that the line is being raised, that the voltage is being raised, and will send a jamming signal saying that, ah, I have detected a collision. And then they'll both wait a random amount of time. Uh, a timer set. It's based on a pseudo-random number generator. And what happens is, after this happens, uh, the device tries it again. It waits until the line is free, retransmits, and continues doing this until the transmission is successful. Now, there are several problems with uh, even having collisions at all, even if they're handled successfully. The first problem is we waste time when we try to handle all of these collisions. And so every time a collision occurs, we have to set a wait timer and wait a random amount of time. Well, obviously, that time could be better spent actually you know, transmitting data. Finally, uh, secondly, we have a problem with bandwidth being shared by all devices. Again, um, all devices that are connected to a hub or connected to the same physical Ethernet link share the same wire. And so the maximum speed of that wire in Ethernet, that's 10 megabytes per second, is the maximum speed shared by all devices. Suppose, for example, that we have 100 devices sharing a single Ethernet wire. Each device would get about 100 kilobytes per second. Now that's extremely slow by today's standards. Um, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years ago it may be considered fast. But that's you know completely dismal considering that you have a 10 megabyte per second line. And so um, again, bandwidth sharing becomes a problem. Second, uh, finally, devices have to take turns, and not strictly speaking in the sense of taking turns, you know, you go first, I go second, somebody else goes third. Um, in the case of Ethernet, obviously all devices are thrown onto the same link and nobody is assigned any particular order to speak, so uh, bandwidth is not guaranteed to any particular host. In manufacturing networks, um, this actually became kind of a worry for some manufacturers because they didn't want some robot on the manufacturing line going haywire and to become inaccessible. They wanted to make sure all devices had at least some sort of equal time. Um, and this way, token ring was actually preferred by the manufacturing industry for a very long time um, until obviously we saw some of the later developments with switching technology that we'll be discussing here in a moment. Only one device may transmit at a time. This causes multiple issues. In fact, that causes all of the issues that you've seen above. Devices connected to a hub, and this is kind of an aside, are said to be on the same collision domain. Now, what do we mean by that? Basically, any devices that share the same Ethernet segment are said to be on the same collision domain. That is, a collision could occur between that device and another device on that same uh, hub or perhaps Ethernet wire. So whenever you see a bunch of devices connected by a hub, you can mentally think, ah, well, those devices basically are sharing all the same Ethernet wire. And so those devices belong to the same collision domain. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we see a picture of a network diagram. 
the solution to all of these problems with collisions is switching. And so basically the idea behind a switch is rather than repeating the same signal to all devices, we want to actually inspect a frame and try to basically switch it to the correct port accordingly. So switches only forward frames to the destination, not to every single host. Unlike a hub, hubs basically send all data to all hosts so that they all share the same physical wire. Every interface on a switch belongs to a separate collision domain. So in this case, we don't have to worry about shared wires, we don't have to worry about shared bandwidth because all of the devices uh, are on separate collision domains. Because the transmit and receive wires aren't interconnected like we saw with hubs, devices can actually listen and talk at the same time. We call this full duplex, and we described this a little bit in the previous module. So now the question comes, how does a switch know where to forward a frame? So how do switches know which devices are connected to which interfaces? And we'll actually talk a little bit about that in the next slide. So when a switch boots up, um, it actually goes through the following process when managing frames. Switches maintain a table of which hosts are connected to which interfaces or which ports. This table is called several things. I will usually refer to it as a MAC address table. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a bridging or switching table or possibly a CAM table. CAM is short for content addressable memory. This is the type of memory used by this sort of table. When the frame is received, the switch notes the source address of that frame. And so by looking at the source address, the switch knows what device that came from and what interface that came in and can create a mapping for that particular host. If there's no entry, it will create an entry. If there is an entry already in the CAM table or in the MAC address table, it will renew that entry. The switch will then look at the destination frame. If it happens to already have an entry in its MAC address table, it will forward the frame out the correct interface. If it doesn't know, if it's not sure, it will forward the frame, it will flood the frame rather, out all of the other ports, except for the port that it originated. So to summarize, when a switch is initially booted, lots of frames will be flooded because the switch has not received any frames from any devices, and so it doesn't really know where any of the devices are. Gradually, as it receives more and more frames, it will actually uh, stop flooding all of those frames because, you know, again, it receives frames from different devices, it'll create a bigger MAC address table, until finally, in a very stable network topology that's been running for a while, the switch will know where all of its connected devices are and be able to switch frames directly. Efficiency greatly improves over time with switches. Switches segment collision domains into their individual ports. This is a process known as micro-segmentation. You may see this thrown out on the CCNA exam. The idea is that every single point-to-point uh, -point link on the switch, every single connection on a switch, is an individual collision domain. Broadcast packets are always flooded. This is because, you know, broadcasts need to get to every single device. And so when we talk about all devices that are on the same local network or all devices that are on the same switch, we refer to them as being on the same broadcast domain. Contrast this with a collision domain. A collision domain are all devices that are on the same wire. But you'll notice that this broadcast domain incorporates several different collision domains, possibly, in the case of a switch. Most switches allow the MAC address tables entries to expire after a certain period, and this allows devices to move from one port to another, for example, and also possibly uh, prevent sorts of different sorts of attacks. Switches solve almost all of the problems that we mentioned with collisions uh, that hubs cause, and so switches have become the de facto standard for implementation in networks today. There are several different ways a switch goes about actually forwarding frames from one interface to another. The first one that we'll discuss is store and forward, uh, fairly straightforward in this case. The switch actually waits to receive an entire frame from the device, so a device will transmit, the switch will receive the entire frame and store it in a temporary buffer. Um, and then it will forward or flood it accordingly, it'll actually you know, completely store the frame, read the source and destination MAC address, run the entire frame through, compare the frame checksum, and send it out. This takes a little bit. But because we actually go through the entire frame and compare the frame checksum, no frames with errors will be forwarded to other interfaces. Another way to forward frames is with cut-through switching. With cut-through switching, a frame is forwarded onto the correct interface as soon as the destination MAC address is read. Since the destination MAC address is the first thing that occurs in a frame, this basically happens almost instantaneously. 
This is the fastest, me fastest method of switching, but if there is an error that occurs in the frame, these errors will be automatically forwarded to the destination immediately. And uh, so this will cause problems if there are lots of errors on your particular network. Most of the time, cut-through switching is what we see in modern networks, um, because Ethernet errors are very, very few and far between, especially with the advent of full duplex. As long as you're using the correct cable type and the cable is good, there shouldn't be any errors. And so cut-through switching provides a very, very, very fast switching speed. There's a kind of a compromise to these two switching methods, and that compromise is known as fragment-free switching. First, I have to answer the question, what is a fragment? A fragment occurs when basically a frame is being transmitted by one device and it gets interrupted after the first 64 bytes are received. Now, Ethernet defines the shortest possible length for a frame as 64 bytes, and so the idea on most Ethernet networks is that no collision should occur after the first 64 bytes are sent. These collisions are referred to as late collisions, and the resulting frames are referred to as fragments. The idea behind fragment free switching is that we want to avoid forwarding, we want to forward frames after the first 64 bytes are received. And this basically assures that no errors due to late collisions, no fragments, will be forwarded. Um, this is, again, kind of a compromise from cut through switching because it avoids forwarding fragments through the network. However, it doesn't provide the same uh, method of checksums that store and forward switching goes. You'll see normally cut through switching implemented on modern networks again, and you'll see store and forward used when a bunch of errors occur. So Cisco switches tend to be adaptive. That is, if they see a bunch of errors occurring, they'll usually switch from cut through to store and forward to ensure that no bad frames get forwarded, um, and they'll try to adapt based on the network. So now I have a diagram up here. Um, I want you to ignore, for the sake of this exercise, the link between the two routers. That link would be considered a point-to-point -point link, not an Ethernet link. Um, and our first you know, modules here are concerned strictly with Ethernet. So ignoring that dashed line between the two routers, I want you to look at this diagram. Um, the device on the far left, lower left, is a computer there you can see. Right above that, at the upper left of the diagram, there is a switch just to the right of that switch is a router and then if you look at the far right diagram lower right uh, right above the computer on the lower right that device there is a hub given all of this information I want to see if you can determine how many collision domains and how many broadcast domains there are in this network so I want you to go ahead pause the video and then you know go through do the exercise see if you can determine how many collision and broadcast domains there are after you're done play the video I'll be waiting here for you So first, let's look at collision domains. Again, keep in mind that switches divide collision domains. That is, every port on a switch is in a different collision domain. And so looking at this diagram, uh, we'll look at the switch on the upper left first. There's a collision domain going down and a collision domain going to the right. That's two so far. Looking at the second switch, that is the switch below the left router, we're going to have a collision domain above and below that switch. That's two more collision domains for a total of four. We're ignoring the point-to-point -point link, so we'll go over to the switch below the right router. That switch is connected to one, two, three different things, and so we have three more different collision domains. Now, what about that hub on the far right there? Well, keep in mind, again, that the hub basically joins those two Ethernet wires into basically what can be considered a single wire. They all share the same voltage. If that computer raises the voltage on one wire, the, 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 the voltage is raised on all wires. And so we end up with that being just one collision domain to the right of the switch below the right router. And so we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven collision domains, with the seventh collision domain being everything connected to that hub. So now let's talk about broadcast domains. Broadcast domains are everything that's on the same switch, and so the way I like to put this, routers segment broadcast domains. So looking at the left router, we have one broadcast domain, that is everything to the left of the left router, uh, so that switch and the computer below it are both in a broadcast domain. And underneath of that left router, we have that switch and the computer there as well, that would be another broadcast domain. Looking now at the right router, you'll notice that all of these devices are on the same router port uh, connected by a switch and a hub, and so all of these devices would be on the same broadcast domain. This puts us at one, two, three broadcast domains. 
This just about wraps it up for our discussion on switching and collisions. Again, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Feel free to comment in the comments section and or rate the video, and I'll see you guys in the next presentation.